Welcome to a Business Growth Mindset Podcast. I'm Christian Lavalsi, and I'm incredibly grateful to be here today and share this episode with you. My purpose is to change the world one person at a time so that I can help them become the very best version of themselves. In today's episode, I explore the work of Rosabeth Moss Cantor on how great companies think differently. In last week's episode, I wrapped up with the six facets of institutional logic, which radically uh, alters leadership and corporate behavior. These facets underpin the research of Rosabeth Moskanta, and today we will explore them together in more detail. Instead of being mere money-generating machines, great companies combine financial, and social logic to build enduring success. To all the business owners and entrepreneurs, the crazy ones, the believers, the doers, the clever makers, the action takers, and everybody else in between, this podcast was designed for you. If this is your very first time visiting my channel or listening to my content, make sure you subscribe by clicking the subscribe button now and also change the notifications alert so you don't miss future episodes. So stick around and listen up. Last week, we explored the difference between a good and bad company and what makes a great company. This week, uh, we explore the work of Rosabeth Moss Cantor on how great companies think differently. Rosabeth Moss Cantor is the Ernest L. Archibuckle Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, where she specializes in strategy, innovation, and leadership for change. She's also the co-founder and former director and chair of the Harvard University Advanced Leadership Initiative which was created to enhance and leverage the skills of already accomplished leaders for maximum impact on significant social problems. Professor Cantor is a Hall of Fame recipient of the Thinkers 50 and received the Lifetime Achievers Award in 2019. Professor Cantor is a former editor of the Harvard Business Review and is the author or co-author of 20 books. The content for, from my podcasts come from an article published in HBR in 2011, which was awarded a 2011 McKinsey Award. This article has significant importance because it acted as a stimulus for uh, pursuing uh, academic study in 2013 and formed the foundation for my persistence to master strategy, social integration, inclusion, diversity, and responsible leadership. It's no secret that making money has long been the ultimate aim of a business. This capitalist vision um, has influenced the majority of corporations uh, limit their goals to generating the highest profits and returns to owners, regardless of the health and safety of employees, the environment, and the general public. Traditional financiers and economists have argued that the sole purpose of a business is to make more money, and the more money, the better. Nobel Prize recipient and economist Milton Friedman in 1970 said, there is, uh, there is one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. (laughs) Traditional theories of a firm such as Friedman's are dominated by the notion of opposition between capital and labor. This disconnects firms from society, which poses conflicts between them. These decisions are expressed solely in financial terms. An institutional logic, as raised by Professor Cantor, is unlike traditional practices. This logic defines a successful company as one which is a vehicle for enhancing social welfare, 
rather than only a money-making machine. Not only can most well-established companies distribute sound returns to shareholders, but they can also build long-lasting institutions. Great companies believe that business is an intrinsic part of society. Now, this means that they recognize society as a pillar like family, government, and religion. So there is no confusion. Let me be very clear. Uh, Great companies work to make money. However, they make choices about how they do so along the way they build an enduring institution. Now, to do this, they invest in the future and have a focus on meeting the needs of people and society. The value a company creates should be measured by how it sustains the conditions that allow it to flourish. This means they must not just measure short-term profits or paychecks. They must create frameworks that use societal value and human values as decision-making criteria. They need to focus on their purpose and address all stakeholder needs by improving the lives of users through their products and services, by providing jobs and enhancing workers' quality of life, by developing strong networks of suppliers and business partners, and by financial viability that provides the resources required for the improvements, innovations, and the return on investment. Today's global economy places a premium on innovation, and that innovation is dependent on human imagination, motivation, and collaboration. What's becoming critical is that firms must seek legitimacy by aligning their corporate objectives with social values. They must gain approvals from authorities, leaders, governments, and members of the public for them to thrive. Firms are increasingly reminded of the need to consider the, well, the often treacherous populist movements and the minority groups when aligning their corporate objectives with social values. Professor Cantor describes six ways great companies use institutional logic. She highlights how it gives them an advantage and how it radically alters leadership, bringing about change and influencing the firm's behavior. These six are, one, a common purpose, two, a long-term view, three, emotional engagement, four, community building, five, innovation, and six, self-organization. Now, I touched on these last week at the very end of the podcast, but today we will explore them in a bit more detail so that you can use, um, so you can begin to adopt them in your business or in your life. You see, having purpose doesn't just reflect in your personal life. It translates into your work. When you align your purpose, it creates many opportunities for you to grow and flourish But more importantly, it becomes a mechanism of fulfillment and happiness. Organizations need to change and adopt frequently in today's ever-changing environment. The pressure that comes from the changeover of human capital poses many risks and burdens on firms. A way uh, to mitigate this risk and burden is to live by having a common purpose and a set of values that underpin the organization. Purpose and values are the very core of an organization's identity. They are used to guide people, to help foster the organization's direction, and it provides the firm with a valuable resource to engage all uh, stakeholders who can assist in the development of diversity, inclusiveness, and profit. It enables people to rise and foster culture that endures and institutionalizes firms. Performance uh, with purpose provides strategic direction and motivation for diverse lines. 
Purpose gives the firm and its stakeholders grounding. Leaders can compensate for business uncertainty um, through institutional grounding because it involves efforts to build and reinforce organizational culture. It's an investment in activities and relationships that often take time to flourish, and therefore, there may not be a direct road to a business result. However, they can reflect the values the firm stands for and how it will endure. Now, stating emphatically and publicly a firm's purpose and values through products and services is a regular part of how great companies express their identity. So what purpose does your organization serve? What purpose are you providing to your company and your team? And what motivators are you using to mobilize your people and customers? Is it purely financial or are you focusing on areas that provide personal satisfaction and fosters culture and action? How is purpose um, and values communicated in your firm and in your place of work? If you're a business owner, you must be able to reflect on these questions and explore them in detail. It's the first step in becoming a great company and it will serve you well. The second area that assists a good company towards becoming a great company is that they develop a long-term focus. By thinking of the company as a social institution, it helps generate a long-term perspective that will help justify the short-term financial sacrifices that are often required to fulfill the firm's purpose and endure time. Great companies will sacrifice short-term financial opportunities if they are incompatible with instrumental values. The values matter because they act as a guide. They identify the company and uh, forms its reputation. It represents the product and defines its quality. It helps form opinions of its customers, service, and any byproducts. The companies that use instrumental logic often invest in the human side of the firm, which helps them create sustainable institutions. For example, firms can commit to emotional integration during an acquisition and merger, or when bringing across uh, border departments together. This can be done by running a series of retreats and conferences intended to spread strategic and operational information, as well as foster social bonding and a feeling of being one. Other organizations uh, focus on expanding their market through community development um, and improving the quality of life for its customers. Now, both have a long-term focus to establish a sustainable institution. The third way uh, great companies differentiate themselves is through emotional engagement. Now, according to Professor Cantor, this is when the transmission of institutional values can evoke a positive emotions, stimulate motivation, and propel self-regulation or peer regulation. Now, emotions play a very large role in governing corporate performance and behavior inside an organization. How many times have you heard the phrase, moods are contagious? In my experience, I have witnessed entire departments and organizations fall foul to one or only a handful of disgruntled or estranged employees. Now, this is not just limited to employees. I've worked with CEOs, founders, and business owners who they themselves impacted the mood of a firm and without intervention would have destroyed the company. Moods affect energy performance, uh, level of effort, attitude, absentism, health, and well-being. Well understood values and principles can increase employee engagement because it acts as a source of emotional appeal. 
It's more than a set of values written on the company website. It's about adhering to the institutional logic and articulating those values regularly, and they must be at the core of the company's work. The very best business owners and executives, they commit a great deal of their time to ensure they breathe life into the culture of their firm. Investing resources and time in communicating values maintains, in fact, gross social purpose by keeping it at the forefront of everyone's mind. This makes the work of the company emotionally compelling. This is a process of nurturing a dialogue to ensure the core values of the firm are used as a guide when making business decisions. Using your company's purpose and values to evoke strong emotions in your employees will give meaning to your brand, and it should be crystallized in your strategy. Remember, people influence one another, and this influences productivity, which impacts all your stakeholders. So ask yourself, how have I touched this year? What have I influenced? Now, once you've answered uh, these questions for yourself, go and ask everyone in your company the same questions. Dive a bit deeper and ask yourself, who is the ringleader in your business or organization? Who has the most influence? Do they respect you? Now, top leaders lead by example, and they communicate with enthusiasm the purpose and values of the company. The key is they must mobilize everyone to own the purpose and values of the company. And as this ensures the values become embedded into the very fabric of the products and services. In fact, they become one with the tasks, goals, and performance. This ensures that charisma is not solely dependent on the leader or leadership group, but it's routinized and spread throughout the company. This is incredibly powerful, and every company has the power to create this. It's not a myth or a false expectation. It's real and requires a long-term strategic focus. For many small to medium-sized firms, partnering with the public, which is the fourth way great companies evolve, may not be top of mind or present itself as obvious. However, in my experience, it's actually critically important and often the area that's overlooked. This is where you have an opportunity to bring business and societal issues together. It provides you with opportunities to focus on the formation of a public-private partnership within your geographical and political landscape. The kind of partnerships that you could consider are international, national, or local activities, large domestic products, as well as small community initiatives. You could do some R&D with your products or services that address a public interest or an unmet societal need. If you are a sole trader or an SME, then consider volunteering efforts. There are many soup kitchens and shelters that could use your time and that of your team. These are very common partnerships that foster a greater good when embedded in your corporate values it changes your organizational behaviors, beliefs, and actions. Partnering with the public is much more than sales and marketing. In fact, it's about you and your firm uh, having a higher level conversation that demonstrates your commitment to furthering the development of your community, state, or countries in which you operate. So ask yourself and your team, what are you doing to engage your community? How can you encourage your team to get personal satisfaction from helping out in your community? And how and what can you invest in that will build a sustainable public project that will yield long-term action and improve the life and quality of your society? 
It's not about saving the world. It's about being present in your community and valuing the people that support your organization and beyond. Number five is innovation. Now, innovation is a very broad area, but before we look at the research from Professor Cantor, let me explain what innovation is. In simple terms, it's an action or process of innovating. Generally, it's about a new method, idea, or product. In business, it can be the concept of improvement. In the works of Professor Cantor, it links a broader purpose than making money. Uh, instead, that broader purpose inspires action and guides um, strategies that open new sources of innovation through diversity, inclusion, and creativity. This allows stakeholders to express their values in their everyday work. So when leaders allocate time, talent, and resources to community projects that serve the community without seeking profit, it gives that company credibility and legitimacy. When you place the attention on society or on social needs, it will often spawn ideas that lead to innovations. Similarly, you can produce business model innovation through institution building as it helps connect partners across ecosystems. Institution build goals are furthered by creating opportunities for individuals to use company resources to serve society. Fostering innovation within the company through its purpose and values and integrating and aligning itself with the community not only creates massive opportunity, but it helps the community connect with your brand as well as offer enormous learning too. Number six is the notion of self-organization. According to Cantor, great companies assume they can trust people and can rely on relationships, not just rules and structures. They are more likely to treat employees as self-determining professionals who coordinate and integrate activities by self-organizing and generating new ideas. Institutional logic is about employees making their own choices, determining which ideas surface and the effort they decide to put in uh, or into them, both at work and outside of work. Now this differs greatly from the traditional considerations that employees are paycheck hungry. They exist uh, to only do the bare minimum and nor are they robots that can produce high performance. Institutional logic assumes that people can be trusted to care about the fate of the entire firm. Now, to do this, you, you must allocate resources beyond the formal strategies and budgetary process. In fact, you need to consider informal relationships, spontaneous actions, and people at all levels. Now, great companies understand that social investment is required to fully understand its social structure and informal networks to optimize performance. Leaders in these companies recognize or reconfigure the rigid formal structures to accommodate for multi-directional pathways for resources and idea flow. New innovations are often the result of when people self-organize to create networks and share information. This can create a potent force for change and it has the power to propel companies in the directions that they never considered. Why? Well, because these people with no formal orders uh, to serve, serve as trailblazers, explorers, entrepreneurs, and innovators for the firm. Now, in summary, great companies think and behave differently because they take action on societal purpose and are driven by values that change the very fabric of their products and services because they are invested with a long-term focus on the community in which they operate in. Institutional logic should be aligned to economic logic. There is no doubt in, in that at all. However, it should not be subordinate to it. Instead, firms should invest in employee empowerment, 
emotional engagement, values-based responsible leadership, and related societal contributions. By using the six facets of institutional logic, you can change the long-term outlook of your firm and your community while building a sustainable institution. If, as a leader, you can begin to consider yourself uh, a builder of social institution with a common purpose, you can begin to master today's challenges and change with the support of all your stakeholders. I have really loved hanging out with you today and sharing my thoughts on this very important and powerful topic that has the power to impact many. I hope that you are able to take the principles and learnings that I have shared with you today and that you can put them into practice in your daily lives and in your businesses and firms. Purpose has become a cornerstone in my teaching and coaching of business owners. Knowing the causes of failure and knowing the habits and principles that help you succeed will allow you to go forward with courage. Building courage is a key instrument in, my, in accelerating my client's growth and deepening their impact both professionally and personally. I want this for you, and this is why I share my knowledge and experience in my podcast each week. If you love today's podcast and are enjoying the series, please, please take a minute to rate it and provide a review. This helps others know that the content I'm sharing is valuable, but also inspires me uh, to share more content with you. Please take care during this time, be kind and be courageous. And until next week, live with purpose.